But the reason I'm opening up and sharing this with you guys is that everything I share comes from, uh, it's simply an extension truly of my own experience, my learnings, my research, my application first in my own life. And then uh, if I can share with you and help one person here avoid unnecessary struggle, uh, then that's why I do what I do. And when we're talking about our teeth, when we're talking about oral health, we, mo we know more today than uh, we've, we've really ever known about how our, our, the health of our mouth is connected to our whole body. And I know as an audience, uh, you're ripe for this conversation because you're interested in continuing to learn and grow in the ways that you take care of yourself. And I know you have a reverence for uh, how the body works together, that what you do to one part, you do to the whole. Welcome to Whole Fit Talks. This is a show just for you, somebody interested in taking ownership of your health, leading your life, and living your legacy. And I'm so pumped you're here because I am another you. Thank you for being here, and thank you for sharing this out with your friends and with your teams. Let's dive into this week's episode. Today, you guys, I'm going to jump right in. We have a focused topic. Uh, you would have seen the pinned post on the Facebook page for it. Today's topic is on total health dentistry, or met what many of you might refer to as holistic dentistry. Okay, you may have seen that I uploaded to the blog about two weeks ago. I uploaded a, a post um, about my experience recently sharing what I've uh, been going through as I've been looking to make some changes and uh, my personal experience with removing two root canal teeth, you guys, you may have been following along and re doing research on things like amalgam fillings, things that growing up, um, we didn't really have conversations around any other way, right? So uh, I'm doing work today to help resolve the impact of some of those decisions. And it's really been only in the last five to six years that things started to turn around for me and my dental health. I, I began integrating more organic, mineral-rich foods, as you likely know, plant medicine in the form of pure essential oils, clean, supportive oral hygiene products, bioavailable supplements. These, these are all pieces of the puzzle. And in today's conversation, you're going to learn more of that total health picture. But the reason I'm opening up and sharing this with you guys is that everything I share comes from, uh, it's simply an extension truly of my own experience, my learnings, my research, my application first in my own life. And then uh, if I can share with you and help one person here avoid unnecessary struggle, uh, then that's why I do what I do. And when we're talking about our teeth, when we're talking about oral health, we, mo we know more today than uh, we've, we've really ever known about how our, our, the health of our mouth is connected to our whole body. And I know as an audience, uh, you're ripe for this conversation because you're interested in continuing to learn and grow in the ways that you take care of yourself. And I know you have a reverence for uh, how the body works together, that what you do to one part, you do to the whole, right? Uh, as you know, you, I know you're already making efforts to live a healthy life and ultimately be your own advocate, specifically if you're tuning in and you're in our doTERRA community. I want to connect a few dots for you uh, just for a moment before we dive right in. As you know, I started sharing and educating uh, almost six years ago on how to integrate these pure essential oils into your health and self-care. And within that time, which in some ways feels very short, and, and sometimes I feel like I've been doing this work my whole life, uh, we have over 75,000 people around the world, just within our whole fit community, that have integrated a more natural form of health and self-care. And, and so five years ago, when I began helping women specifically that were seeking and ready to take a level of personal autonomy, uh, they were they were very open, right? They were very interested in making more decisions for their health. And if we fast forward to today, and what I, if I take a pulse on where we're at, um, and and the the customers that I seem to be working with today, the the biggest obstacle I have found for for people today is learning to trust themselves more, is is learning to adopt a more natural method of health and self care, and perhaps unlearning a little bit of what we were brought up to, to believe about health, um, which 
if I could define that, I think I had a very um, separate view of the body growing up. I, I, we weren't taught that everything is connected. We did, we weren't really raised to have that holistic perspective when looking at the various parts of our body. And so uh, part of our conversation today with my guest, we'll, we'll be talking about that topic of how important it is to feel confident to make decisions for yourself, uh, even when it might not be the mainstream way, okay? And I know many of you here are, are, are already doing that in many ways, so you're gonna love our topic today. If you're tuning in live, we may have some time to do some questions, so feel free to submit, that, to submit them to the chat there. I can see as you're tuning in here, all of you that are hopping in live, uh, but I want to, uh, in just a few minutes, I want to welcome our guest on. Uh, our guest today is Dr. Farahani. This conversation is a piece of the total health picture and the personal autonomy like I was just talking about. And he and I have had many meaningful conversations on this topic, uh, which is that capacity to truly decide for yourself. And I trust that this conversation will expand your knowledge as, as you make decisions going forward. You know, I'm a big fan of that. And um, I'm gonna just give you a quick intro for him and then we're gonna bring him up on screen. So Dr. Farahani has been known for years, you guys, as a leader in the interplay of how dental health and overall health works together. So his opinion has actually been sought out by hundreds of naturopathic doctors across Ontario, as well as publications such as Alive Magazine, The Globe and Mail, and The Toronto Star. Uh, he also, in 2016, was on a learning exchange at the world famous Paracelsus Clinic in Switzerland, which was featured in the Truth About Cancer series. I know many of you have, have watched that. He does guest lectures on his approach to total health dentistry, and we'll, we'll talk about this during the interview. He uh, has a new podcast coming out of that same name. It actually, I believe, launches next week, month of September. He has a clinic in Stratford, Ontario, and he's about to open up a new one in Kitchener, which we'll also talk about. And, and there they do a full range of holistic dental services, um, such as fluoride-free checkups, strict protocols for removing amalgam fillings, natural gum care, metal-free implants, and his specialty um, is really having an emphasis on that total health. So I know you guys are going to dig this conversation today. I'm going to bring him up on screen right now so you guys can see him. If we are blurry, you guys, I just want to let you know that the audio will be great uh, and we will upload it to the podcast. So sometimes we deal with things out of our control when it comes to video. But welcome, my friend. Can you... Uh, can we do a quick sound check? Hey, everybody. Thank you so much, Ange, for having me today. I'm uh, very excited to be here. Thank you. Awesome. Yeah, you sound good. So I first learned of your work uh, about eight years ago when a friend of mine, uh, she was actually seeking out a more, I'll say, holistic uh, perspective or guidance in handling some of her, her dental issues she was experiencing. And then fast forward to about two years ago, I personally, I like to call it, um, I had a root canal go rogue. Okay, so a root canal I had done years and years ago that I started to have issues with pain and it had formed a small abscess and I wanted to have a second opinion before I went through a repeat procedure of that. And that's how I first, um, I became, I was referred to you actually. And, and we, as, we, as I met you and we started having many conversations, I felt very aligned with um, just your, your perspective. And, and we've had a lot of great conversations around uh, just how the work you do fits with the total health picture. And uh, I'm really excited to have you here. And I, I think what I want to open up with is, is have you roll back the tapes a little bit and, and share with us, uh, how did you become who you are today as, as somebody who is a revered dentist and educator in total health dentistry? How did this become your passion? Well, you know, just you mentioned how we first met and how our alignment, it was the clove oil. You told me this sometime, uh, more recently. You told me that as soon as I applied the clove oil, this is before I knew you were in, you know, anything with essential oils, this is something I was using. And then you told me that I thought, ah, <laughs> that must have turned on a, a lot of good, good signals for you. So, you know, I don't know if anybody gets into this too, too consciously, but I certainly have always been one to ask the question, why? And everything starts with, with that. And you just ask yourself why, and that leads to another question, and you don't, you're not satisfied with that answer, and so you dig deeper. And really, that's really as innocently as it came. But there was one seminal moment I could kind of remember. It was watching the documentary called The Corporation. The Corporation. And it talked about, uh, you know, how corporations are and what, they, what their makeup is. And after that, 
documentary, I became very conscious of what I started to put in my body. This was 2003, what I was eating. I was reading a jar of hot salsa and I saw the ingredients. I thought, well, salsa is supposed to be pretty simple. What is all of this? It didn't take long after reading ingredients that I was putting into my body that I asked myself, well, wait a minute, what am I putting into my patient's body? And that next question really began the whole journey in, in earnest for me. Mm, I love that. It's it's just asking enhanced or better questions. We that land us here, right? I often say to people when they ask, "How did you? How did this all happen?" And I, I always say that it just began with asking the right questions, time after time. Um, you and I have talked at length about the topic of advocating for yourself and um, for your health, and for many of our listeners here, many of them are mo mothers, right? They're they're really trying to make the best decision. Uh, on behalf of the family and for their kids. Um, talk to us about what that means to you, what it means to practice autonomy when making decisions in your health. It's almost everything for me. It's so, so huge. The topic of informed consent, of course, is a big thing that I, I have a personal, yeah, I just have a personal interest in it because I feel that um, in dentistry, we're striving to do this. We're striving to provide informed consent and uh, do it do it well. And of course, uh, we're, we're we're always improving. And autonomy, though, is the key sort of the key thing for me that I love that I, I get excited about. And this is what your audience is practicing. They're practicing autonomy, which is which is to self govern, which is to choose what they put into their own bodies, into their own homes into their own mouths and into the mouths of their families, right? So to me, when I'm dealing with my, with my patients um, and everything I think about autonomy, patients have this inalienable right to choose what they put into their bodies. That can't be taken away by age, by, you know, popular trends, by, you know, it doesn't matter if I'm, uh, you know, I've, I've come from the Institute of something, 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 something. Uh, it doesn't take away your right to choose what's in your body. And of course, you need to have a trustworthy team around you so that, so that you, they can educate you as to all of your choices. And But then at the end of the day, you have that decision. It's not something we can take away from you or anybody can ever take away from you. Big thing. Mm -hmm. Why, what do you think is the, the barrier for people practicing more autonomy in their health and perhaps making decisions that aren't what they've been told or mainstream? <laughs> oh, gosh, really, the answer is, a, is there, there's a deeper answer, which we won't have time to get into, I think. <laughs> we may do another one. Do another yeah. one. Um, obviously, people are busy. Um, and so we rely on various aspects, various people. I remember myself, look, I'm not immune. I'm not, you know, uh, immune to any of this. I, I remember back in a time when I used to think that if it was in the grocery store, it was food. And I realize now if it, it doesn't, that's not the case. Just because it's in a grocery store, it doesn't mean it's food. Mm -hmm. It can be, it can be categorized as food, but it, it doesn't, have, it's not food. So I think we're busy and it's imperative to have people like yourself doing what you're doing, educating everybody, your community, so that they can have one or two or three trustworthy places they can go and say, aha, I can trust this source. I can know this. This will save me doing five, 10 hours of research on time, which I don't have time to do. So I think the barrier in time is a big one. So that's why what you're doing is so, so. Mm, that's such a great point because we live in such an instant access time, which is a blessing, but also very overwhelming. Um, so it's so important to find people who can help you connect the dots, people you trust. Uh, you know, it's, yeah, it's, uh, it is, it's, it's with all of the information we have today, it can be o o information overload. I think it's tough for people to make decisions. And this is why ultimately it's, it's learning to trust yourself more, coming to a place of making decisions that are aligned for you, even if everyone is saying to go right and you decide to go left, right? It's so... Uh, I do want to get into, and also, and if I just add as a process, um, you know, I'll meet, I'll meet a patient, I'll meet one of my team members, and when they first come on board, they feel a little overwhelmed. They're like, mm -hmm. they might say, "Well, Dr. Farhani, you know, um, I want to work for you, but I don't eat 
uh, or maybe I don't drink, you know, pure organic uh, carrot juice like you do. Can I, you know, how, you know, do you know, what? I'm being very real. This is a very serious and very real uh, question or concern or anxiety. And I just say to them, I say to them, you know, Jane, um, what you're eating today will not be what you're eating five years from now. Your cupboards, whatever they look like now, will not look the same in five years. They'll just be a very beautiful, natural progression year by year by year. You will just substitute things out that don't make sense to you, that don't align to you. So don't worry about a timeline and having to get to a certain point at a certain you know, period of time. Just just be every day vigilant. Do your best. You'll make you'll take a couple steps back. You'll take a couple steps forward. It's all it's it's totally fine. But I'm very, very practical about everything I do and recommend to in health as I hope. We'll get it. Mm, yes, so much wisdom there. I'm a huge fan of being practical. Whenever I share something, I always want to make sure, okay, how can this be brought into real life? Yeah. Uh, and that's a great point you make. We talk about this quite a bit, right? In this community, which it's it's so overwhelming when you think of all the things that you could change in your health. And you guys, as I've opened up and shared some of my experiences this year, this has been a year for me personally of cleaning up a lot of decisions I made, honestly, decades ago. And I share it because, A, I want you to know it's never too late to make those changes for yourself. But also, as we learn better, we do better. And, and this is why I want this conversation uh, to be something that really serves you no matter where you are. And I do want to get into a couple of, um, I suppose, hot topics with you. We'll approach them in the best way we can. But just before I do that, in your many years practicing how much has your industry changed and evolved over that time? Like, I'm sure there's been um, many approaches you've seen come and go over the years. Um, but how would you describe the current state of dentistry? Wow, that's a burner of a question. That's terrific. Um, it's it's a it's an extremely exciting time in dentistry because really, I've, from I've been in practice 20 years, and so now I can really see that you know my profession and um, the popular sort of, you know, themes and concerns are really starting to come together, which is a wonderful thing. Every every one every profession as great as a great profession like dentistry. I mean, we're here to serve the public. So, to the extent that we start to become aligned with the public's concerns, what's on their mind, then the better we can serve um, our patients. So, what's happening? Just you know, there was a couple of very recent. After our discussions, we saw there were, um, you know, two very recent articles that came out. One, do you want to get into those? The one about the fluoride right now? Yeah, that was actually my first hot topic. So let's talk about fluoride for sure. Let's go right in. I mean, so, you know, in dentistry, we, we advocate for the use of um, fluoride topically and as well as in, as in water, or water fluoridation. I go back to autonomy. So for me, I don't, I'm not pro fluoride. I'm not against fluoride. I'm for pro autonomy. Mm -hmm. So I'm for, for the, for each patient choosing to decide and that, that makes best sense for them after they've done own ability. Look, if somebody's extremely passionate about fluoride, they're going to do a ton of research. If they're not extremely passionate about fluoride, they're not going to do a ton of research on it. And then they're okay to accept. They've made a choice not to spend half their life studying fluoride and then they're okay with somebody giving them a drink but the, giving them a choice or, or deciding for them or whatever but autonomy autonomy come on you have to choose what you want um and and for me fluoride has to be a choice um i think that i, I don't agree with 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 the with not having your uh, patient people not having the right to choose so therefore water fluoridation right is not an autonomous Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's everybody's getting it. Right. And so this study that came out and this is, this is very recent. It just came out. This I year. printed it. <laughs> Thank you. You sent it over to me. Um, and we'll put the link in the show notes, but, um, if you are on a device, you want to look it up on a separate device, you guys, uh, it was published by JAMA, right. Which is the, the journal of, um, American Medical, Medical Association. And it's titled, this was actually published recently, right? August, yes. last week, August 19th. Association between maternal fluoride exposure during pregnancy and IQ scores in offspring in Canada. So Canadians in the house, this was 
done just for us. Um, and as I read the study and it, it said that 38% uh, of Canadian residents basically have no choice in, in fluoridation. It's even higher in the US. It says here that 66% of US residents will have water fluoridation. It's much lower and so Europe has 3%. Right. So there are, there are some countries who haven't taken a one size fits all approach here. Um, but you mentioned. Oh, and I'll just share while we're talking about this study. And if please expand on it. I just highlighted what I thought was interesting here. Sure. The um, the conclusion they came to. And I believe that they studied over 500 pregnant women Correct. across three trimesters. Correct. They came to the conclusion that maternal exposure to higher levels of fluoride during pregnancy was associated with lower IQ scores in children aged three to four. These findings indicate the possible need to reduce fluoride intake during pregnancy. So here's what I wanna ask you. When something like this comes out, right. what's the ripple effect within your industry? How, and do you find there's a lot of patients that come in saying, hey, I saw this, what, you know, again, how do we steer that conversation? You asked me, you know, where we are in a profession, where we are at sort of at in our profession at this stage in the game in 2019, and it's an exciting time because of these, because of the research that's coming out, we can have meaningful dialogue. So let's say Monday morning, mom comes to me and says, hey, doc, I saw this study somewhere uh, in Angie's, you know, uh, community, et cetera. And what do you think I should do? And I would say, well, re really now you, you really have the chance to practice autonomy. If you want fluoride, if you think, you see, what, we're, what the study shows is a mom now has a, has a choice. They can say, okay, I accept for fluoride because this can help you know offset cavities in my children right that's a potential benefit and i accept the risk that i might have more you know um, iq de deficiency measurable iq deficiency in, in my child and that's a risk it's not going to happen every time but that's my risk and i accept that because now and that's practicing autonomy and if they but if they're like no no under no circumstances i'll take the cavity i'll take a you know if my child gets a cavity fine i'd rather accept that risk rather than have any influence on IQ potentially, well then great. You know, they're, they're, we've had a meaningful dialogue. Um, I don't do fluoride anyway. So, but, but that conversation um, for all my, you know, all my profession is something I'm excited for them to have because yeah, this is going to only create more trust. It's going to create more, more, you know, just better relationships between the, between dentists and their patients. You know, and in, in the healthcare industry, in general, more people want to have those conversations with their practitioner. They want to have the time to just talk about the cause and effect. And it's almost, you know, as you've said that, it's not as if there's one route forward that doesn't have any cause and effect, right? Everything has a an effect right. when we make a decision and we need to understand that. So it's almost like you're always weighing. This is what I always say, um, so for those of you in our oil community, for example, many of you are mothers and I, I totally understand where you're coming from as a mom who's only who's raised my girls to only know a more natural approach first. We always exhaust that first. Um, but a common concern you have is, is it safe to use something like a pure essential oil with my child? And my question is always, I always come back with a question, what would you have used instead? So what was going to be the alternative? And let's talk through that. If you were going to, without any caution, grab um, a synthetic medication, have you asked the same questions of that? Have you weighed the effect of that, right? These are the conversations we want to be having to really think more critically. That's what we're saying, right? Understand. And, and also, as we were talking earlier about autonomy, and I was thinking of how we have access to all the information today. We can find everything we need to know on Google and YouTube today. With that though, we could find anything we needed to to support the direction we're heading in, right? If we if we feel like fluoride is probably not a good idea because we're, we're worried about the potential neurotoxicity and the brain health of our children, we will find umpteen articles that support that to help us make that decision. On the reverse, a study like this comes out, you guys, and what you'll see is generally it's, it's knocked down um, as if to say the sample size of 500 pregnant women was not enough, right? You'll see things come out and say, that's, that's hogwash because that's not a big enough sample size. But then if you don't think critically, you might not go to the next step of asking, well, show me the research that shows it's safe on a population that's larger than that. And you might not find it. So it really is about asking the right questions always. And 
I, I really appreciate that you create a space. What I found when I visited you is you create a space where there's, it doesn't feel rushed uh, and where these conversations can really take place. I think that that's really what's missing today um, for the most part. So you want me to give you my, my quick 101 fluoride 101 perspective? Please. My quick fluoride 101 perspective is this. Fluoride is, is revered as a way to make teeth harder. Right. But it actually makes teeth more brittle. And it makes bones more brittle. The biochemistry doesn't make it harder. It makes it more bit brittle, more difficult to resolve. And, and that, by making it more brittle and, and less like a real tooth, it makes it more resistant to cavities. Interesting. Which is the favorable part. Favorable part. That's what we want. <laughs> However, um, the ex what we are, what we're taking in exchange for that is the brittleness. And when we take it systemically, it's not just going in our teeth, of course. It's going in our bones. Right. So if you ever see somebody who's got damage or you know fluoride spots or yellow spots on their teeth from too much fluoride exposure, I tell those patients, look, if you were to peel back your skin, you might have that on your bones as well. Mm. It didn't just go to your teeth; it went into your whole all your bones. We just can't see inside your bones because your skin's covering it. Nevertheless, so the risk is my always my my thing has always been this: if the, to, to get around the cavity prevention aspect, or to, to do another way to, to prevent cavities, I go through nutrition. Let's mm -hmm. go alkaline nutrition. If your pH is alkaline all the time or most of the time, then you're not going to, it's going to be very difficult to get a cavity. So that's been over the last many years, that's been my protection to moms is the conversation is, oh, how do we get your child and your family's you know, pH more alkaline? And that's been our sort of solution to, uh, not not having to have the side effects of fluoride. So in a fluoride 101, that's 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 what it is. If you want to avoid fluoride, you got to get very serious about an alkalizing you know, alkalizing solution. You know, as you were saying that, it reminds me of years ago when we started to realize that drinking five glasses of milk a day was not necessarily creating stronger bones. In fact, they were finding that in um, areas like North America, where that was heavily promoted through government published food guides, there were higher rates of osteoporosis within milk drinking communities. And it was, and so the thinking that if I drink something that has a lot of calcium, it's going to infuse the bones with more calcium. It's kind of like the same conversation with um, vitamins versus the whole food, right? Right. Uh, nature. And the body works best with something that is packaged properly, not just right. forcing the body to uptake something. So, um, yeah, that's really interesting. And I think we're going to we're going to talk about nutrition um, in a few minutes, just sure. as the one of the pillars for healthy teeth. But can we move on to another hot topic? Of course. OK, mercury fillings, which many. OK, I'm, I'm going to say the stuff that maybe you can't. So. <laughs> Mercury fillings, you know, amalgam fillings, as you'll commonly hear them. If you are an 80s baby like me, your mouth probably has at least one, right? Shout out, where are all my 80s baby friends? Wow. <laughs> um, so one of, uh, there's a lot of concern today. And what's, what's always interesting to me is one of the things that you practice in your clinic is safe removal of amalgam or mercury fillings. And one of the things I always find interesting is the protocols that are necessary to remove these from the mouth. Um, it, it only thinks, or it only makes sense if you think about it, it's sitting there in your mouth and we're chewing food all day. And, and I wanna ask you some questions about that and the, um, you know, some of the things that we hear about that, but it's interesting that steps are taken to uh, remove them safely when they could be sitting in your mouth for 20, 30, 40, 50 years, right? And we're not asking those questions. So I want to start off by saying, should all mercury or amalgam fillings be removed or are there cases where maybe it's okay to leave them in? Well, let me just make, make my, an autonomous decision for all my patients, Ange. I'm not going to do that, right? <laughs> okay. okay. So of course, that's entirely that, that this, is, this is the whole thing. I want every, all of my patients, uh, across, every, all of your audience, all your listeners to make these choices for themselves um, after they've had a proper consultation with someone like myself, like many, many other, you know, dentists who are, who are interested and, um, you know, 
involved in this in this kind of process. So you just have to ask yourself, does it make sense for you to have mercury exposure day in, day out? Look, amalgam mercury fillings are the number one source of mercury for human beings. That's World Health Organization, 1991. Okay. Fish is a far, far cry number two. We get nine times, you can see it might be nine times more mercury from our amalgam fillings than we do from fish, nine times. And that's across, this is the World Health Organization. So look, every person now with this information can begin to make a different form decision. Does this make sense for me in my, in my health picture? Is it worth my while to begin to go down this road? Because I can't make, wave a magic wand and remove your <laughs> mercury fillings. There's a whole process and et cetera. So, but if it does, right, as, as millions and millions of people, it does make sense for them to do this. They decide, okay, I do want to do this. All right, great. Uh, find somebody who, you know, talk to your dentist, speak to other dentists who are aligned with you and your interests. And um, the IAOMT is a great resource for that. I-A-O-M-T. I'm going to type that in for people. That was one of the questions that popped up is how do I find somebody to do safe removal? And, and again, uh, I don't use the word safe or unsafe. I use the word strict protocols. They, we use a very strict protocol when we remove these mercury fillings. And to me, it makes sense because we're able to, you know, harness and capture the mercury vapor very, very efficiently. And that's the point. The point is not just to blast the mercury out of your tooth and then move it into your brain or move it into some other part of your body. The point is to take it from here and have it go. And to do that, you need, it, it's very, very wise. You gotta have some, you gotta have some plan of action and, uh, and, and we do. So that's what we do a lot is we have a, a strict protocol, the IAOMT protocol that, uh, that helps drastically reduce the amount of exposure to a patient. When I was in Switzerland uh, at the Paracelsus clinic it was a 2016 summer to the learning exchange there and I was watching how they were doing it and I brought back some of the tips that they were using and I actually shared with them some of the things that we were doing that they weren't doing hmm. and so we really uh, we really had a beautiful learning and the net, the net result is of course our patients uh, benefit so the IAAONT uh, does that is that just Canada US North America so if somebody asked a question here how do I find someone local I'm in the states Yes, if you go to, and I just put that, I just typed it there for you, and I A O M M as in Mary T dot org. If you go to find a dentist, you'll find somebody close. Okay. Uh, hopefully close by. Go to find a dentist, you'll hopefully find somebody close by. Perfect. So, a natural question you mentioned um, amalgam fillings being the number one source of mercury to the body. Right. What are you able to say, what is the concern of having mercury? Does it store up in your tissues? What's the concern? Yeah, the old, you know, mercury is toxic. That's not, that's not a, um, that's not a stroke of uh, new news. <laughs> it's not fake <laughs> news. <laughs> it's, not news. <laughs> it's not new news. You know, I tell my patients, mercury is not a vitamin. You don't need a certain amount every day. Um, so, yeah, I mean, there's, uh, there's if the fillings are 50% mercury, when the mercury is released, when we eat, when we drink hot liquids, of course, when they're drilled out, always releasing mercury above room temperature. Uh, so in our mouth, it's always above room temperature. So, I mean, it's always, uh, it's always, mercury is always coming out. It gets stored in our kidney. Um, of course, it crosses the uh, placenta uh, barrier as well. So, um are there tests that somebody can do to know what their levels are? There are. Um, you can just see a qualified physician, a qualified naturopathic doctor, someone who takes a particular interest in mercury. Toxicity is a real specialty of medicine. It's really not something, it's, it's not like a common cold. So you can't, you really need somebody who's like a specialist in heavy metal toxicity to be able to understand this. That would be a qualified medical healthcare professional, not a dentist. Certainly I'm not, I never, you know, someone says to me, are these making me sick or am I, I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm your dentist. Um, I can help you remove this with a strict protocol, but I'm certainly not qualified or interested in making any kind of medical, um, yeah, medical. 
decisions are anything for you. Yeah, I understand that. And the IAOMT website, um, any dentist listed there is, is somebody that is known for using strict protocols to remove amalgam fillings, correct? Yes, they would be up. Okay, cool. Anything else you want to mention as far as fillings go? What like what what is being done today that is perceived as perhaps a safer route? You know, I've just uh, spent a considerable amount of time recording my first fifteen podcasts uh, and my total health dentistry podcast that's coming up, launching next week. And and my my audience, my target was to give people bite sized, realistic bite sized pieces about um, you know about all of these great great questions so i'll be very i'll be brief here just because of our time we have a, an hour to talk about everything but if people want more information please visit the website which you'll talk about later um, and, and i'll go into all of these in more, much much more detail the good news is that we do have a great we do have great options today we have you know basically three options to replace mercury fillings we've got you know plastic white fillings and i use a bpa free one i talked all about that mm. uh, we have porcelain fillings and we have gold fillings they each have their pros and cons they each have their you know indications and i talk about all of that also on the podcast so the one thing maybe i'll leave this with you uh, on the leave this topic is this a lot of people will say let sleeping dogs lie you've heard that this expression before let sleeping mm -hmm. dogs lie so if it's not you know bothering me leave it hey that's a that's an autonomous decision you want to make that decision no problem what i can tell you though is that these mercury fillings they crack teeth they they, split, they split teeth okay so if if you you know you think about what a filling is it's a tooth is like a two by four we stick a big metal you know uh, nail into this two by four and we bang on it we chew on it so we kind of the metal just splits teeth and so these things forget the mercury i tell my patients look let's say you really love mercury <laughs> these things break teeth so um you should be aware of that uh leaving sleeping dogs lie until your tooth disintegrates and comes in you come in come into come, on, come into my office with your tooth all disintegrated i'll be like well how did that go for you you know that letting the sleeping dogs lie um so just mm -hmm. for thought yeah yeah um and it's a piece of the puzzle it might not be what somebody does today but it might be what they include as part of their healing their health going forward in the coming years um jan i just wanted to pull up her comment she said i had received bad removal of fillings and found myself in a puddle of no energy two weeks later and had to get help cleansing from it no protection for anyone in the room so it is yeah it is it's it's really important that you find somebody who's going to practice a safe removal um, and again, a lot of people are asking, like, should I have them removed? I loved your answer there. I think everybody has to make that decision for themselves based on their current state of health. And I often say to people, you know, if you have a lot of, if you have systemic issues going on, things that are happening, you can't figure out what's going on. This is worth looking into, right? Because we know the mouth is a, is a, it's almost a mirror of the body and, and the health that's happening across the whole picture. So, um, okay. Next topic, root canals, <laughs> which was how I actually came to meet you. So let's have a discussion about endodontics. And this, this is the field of dentistry, you guys, that focuses on the biology or pathology of dental pulp and the tissue surrounding the roots of the teeth. The teeth. So specifically, the topic of root canals comes into play here. And this is probably more controversial you know, within the topics. I'm not sure how many of you had... Um, had time to watch uh what was the name of that documentary root cause it was pulled by netflix actually because of pressure i believe within the ada the american dental association you can still see it you can still find it online there's a lot of information coming out today um around the health implications connected to root canals and whether i think a, a lot of us when we're presented the option to keep a tooth or have a tooth removed, we wanna to try to keep a tooth, right? That's at least why I chose to have a, uh, several. You guys, I was talking to my mom, I, was, she, I know she's on Instagram. I was visiting with her uh, over the weekend and that was one of my first dental procedures. I think I was seven or eight years old. I had a root canal done, that's when it started. And over the course of my adult life, I've had four. 
Um, I and you can read my blog post just um, for for more expansion of that information. Um, but you know, when presented that, it's what we will typically say. Oh no, I don't want to have a tooth pulled. I want to try to save the tooth, and this is why a root canal. Um, would be done. And I guess I first want to open up, we had been talking about an article that was just um, an article you sent me just around the paradigm shift happening within that realm of dentistry. Can you open up just talking about how yeah. things are shifting? Yes. Uh, as I said, there's an exciting time for us in dentistry because we're starting to learn more about the role of mouth infection and, and body health, right? Um, we're starting to, the research is starting to mount and starting to accumulate and so we're this very uh, recent uh, article in the in the Canadian Dental Association discussed how you know a it confirms what we already know a we can't get rid of all the infection out of root canals um, root canals there's no such thing as like all of all there's no evil dental procedure every dental procedure has its you know merits and uh, and so on and so you know, I myself had a root canal treatment um, several several years ago because at that point in time, I needed it to get me to the next stage where I was ready for somebody to... I knew, I knew ultimately I didn't want the root canal, but I needed that tooth in there because as maybe we'll get to later, when you remove a tooth and do nothing, your jawbone just starts to shrink and disappear. I knew I wanted an implant later. Uh, so for me, I used a root canal as a you know, a spare tire to get me from point A to point B until I could get to know to get what I needed with an implant. So just to say there's no, I'm not, you know, anti and evil and so on and so forth. But what is a root canal? A root canal is a way to, you know, clean out a lot of the infection out of the tooth. But we've known in dentistry for years, we can't get rid of all of it. And this recent article, you know, again, confirms that despite our greatest and you know, research. And so now what we're trying to do in dentistry, very interesting. We're trying to use more natural, more, you know, friendly, biocompatible materials in the root canal to try to, you know, suppress, control, treat even the infection. A, we acknowledge it's there. And B, we're trying to treat it gently, more kind. Because in the 80s, root canals, we used to use some very, very harsh, nasty chemicals. Mm-hmm. Nasty, nasty. Oh, the 80s. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, the, the bad hair and the bad chemicals. <laughs> I'm still a fan of the scrunchie, right? A lot of neon, but right. not a fan of some of the health beliefs back then. Right. <laughs> and so, uh, excuse me. Yeah, while he's uh, just addressing that, you know, it's I love what you said there that it was kind of a spare tire until you were ready to make a different decision down the road. It bought you a little bit more time, like yourself. Yeah, you you were so like yourself, and so if I can just touch on your particular case because obviously I'm your dentist, I know what will happen in your case if I if I may. Let's do it. Um, your situation was fairly common. You know, you had a root canal done many many years ago, and it was quiet uh, and not doing anything for a while, and then out of the blue, two three years ago or you know whenever it started to become you know tender, irritated, it started to look maybe shadowy on the X-ray. Well, what happened? What happened there? Here's what happened. A, you you always sorry you always had your infection. Okay, that was that was never gone. That was always there. There was always a small amount of infection, whatever that amount was. We can't measure it, but it was always infection. And B, uh, your immune system was always on to be able to counteract and beat this. Mm -hmm. And when and maybe years and years and years ago, you had other things that your immune system was busy focusing on. But as you started to cleanse and cleanse and cleanse and cleanse, your immune system was like, okay, who's next up to bat, right? right? What's the next problem child or whatever? And, and so it was your root canal. And then so your root, so, so your root canal began to become more infected and inflamed. And then your immune system was like, all right, now it's time to go after. Well, it, it, it began to fight it in earnest, which is why it became uh, inflamed. Mm -hmm. it, it, your, immune, your immune system was reacting to this infection in a, what we say is a negative way, but it's actually a positive way, right? If you get an if you get inflamed, your immune system is working and fighting for you. You got a problem, man. You got to deal with that. So, anyways, that was your thing. That was your your path, your reaction, very common. And um, yeah, you decided to do what you did, which is to remove it um, and clean it up. Because, like you said, it it never was completely gone. 
it, it's, it sounds like it's impossible to truly clean out the issue when you have a root canal and there was no amount of clove oil that was ever going to reach that, right? It did not matter how much oil pulling I was doing, you guys. It didn't matter how much uh, intense plant wisdom I was throwing at that situation. It was literally unreachable. And that's something I want to actually talk about. Root canals are quite literally the only practice we do where we leave a dead part of the body intact, where we you know, and I, I said, I said in the blog, if you read the post, you know, if we, if you had severe frostbite on your arm and the, and it, a part of your arm died, you wouldn't leave that there, right? You wouldn't walk around with decayed dead tissue attached to your body. You would have a surgery to have that removed. And essentially, at least my interpretation, correct me if I'm wrong, when we do a root canal, we're leaving a dead part of the body in the body with no way for the body to reach it when something goes wrong. That's correct. The, the tooth itself, you know, is dead. The tissues around the tooth are alive, of course, um, but the tooth itself is dead. So for example, a common question might, someone might ask, and it's a very good question, say, well, well, doc, if I have an infected root canal, why can't you just give me some antibiotics? Right. Give me some antibiotics, clear up the infection, life goes on. And here's why. Antibiotics travel in blood, right? Blood is the transporter, it's the train. But there's no train going to that infection. There's no blood supply going to that tooth. I mean, it stops right at the tooth. It doesn't go inside. So you can, I tell my patients, you can, you know, swim in a bath of antibiotics every single day. You know, make yourself a little tub of antibiotic and go in it. You can't, the, the blood flow doesn't go into the tooth cause. So antibiotics, unfortunately, are not able to clean up the inside of the tooth that's 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 got the dead you know, infected tissue in it. So all they really do in that situation is help the help fight off the impact of that within other areas of the body. Correct. The spread, right? Exactly. It's the, the spread side of the tooth that mm. the where the blood the blood does have access to, and that's where it can it can get act and clean up that access, but it doesn't get really into that. So are there situations where a root canal doesn't become a problem for people? Sure. Uh, if you've got a, you know, a couple of things. Have you ever, have you ever had, let, let's say the last two, three, four, five colds you've had, right? Have they all been the same severity? No. So what kind of infection is inside of your tooth? Is it a relatively, you know, uh, mild or, you know, the, the, the bacteria, how virulent, right? How aggressive is the infection that's inside your tooth? If it's very virulent, it, it won't make it. It'll just be too powerful. Hmm. Uh, if it's if it's less virulent, then yes, your body can can combat it. The, the the amount of cleaning we're able to do will be very effective, and you can you can uh, obviously keep a close eye on it. Talk talk to your dentist and say, you know, doctor, you know, can we keep a close eye on this and make sure it's still good year after year and if there's a problem let's just have a discussion about it and be very open about it and we can talk about our options including keeping the root canal you know these are all fine um but let's get that dialogue happening in the rooms and um but so the two things are one is how infect how aggressive is the infection in there and b what is your immune system doing how strong is your immune system if your immune system is rock solid Great, you can resist a ton of uh, even even a more aggressive infection. If your immune system is teeter tottering, yeah, even a little cold will get you right. So even a, even a little infection or a or a, a less aggressive infection inside of a root canal will uh, you know could potentially be problematic for your system. So those are the two things. You ask me when can it be good? Well, the whole when when can it be okay to have a root canal and can perform well? It's it's how aggressive is the infection and how good is your uh, immune system in response to it. And it will typically express itself in the form of an abscess, right? Once the body, when there is a pretty deep rooted infection, that's what happened for me. Yes. Yeah, it's got, sorry, one other thing, when you see an abscess, right, on a tooth that's coming out the end of the tooth and they're like a shadow in the, uh, on the x-ray, let's say, Sometimes in, in dentistry, I think sometimes, and I would say this to my colleagues, just to, you know, when you're speaking to your patients, sometimes we get a little bit dismissive of infections because, oh, it's just a small infection, right? It's just a little bit of infection. Well, in reality, what we're seeing at the edge of the root, that's just a surplus. 
That's just the excess infection. The infection came from inside the tooth. It's like when there's a, you know, when there's a house, you know, the chimney, the smoke that's coming out of the chimney, that's just the excess smoke. The, 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 the real source of the infection is the fireplace itself inside of the house. So it's easy to look at the little, you know, smoke that's coming out of the chimney stack and say, ah, that's just a little smoke, no big deal. But it's actually what's on the inside. That's where it's coming from. So just a little, a little note when you're discussing with your dentist about having an intelligent conversation about this. Hmm. Guys, if you um, are into this, you can actually go to my blog post and see what mine looked like when it came out. I remember your expression. You're like, oh, that's one to take a picture of. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was pretty scary. That's interesting, that, you know, how you said what you finally see on something like an x-ray is, is not even as big of an issue as it is. Once you take the tooth out, you really do see it, right? You couldn't have even seen. Oh, yeah. It's just, it's pretty gross. I, I didn't post the picture publicly. You have to click a link to see it, just so you know. Didn't want to scare you all off. Um, so the other big question is, let's say somebody comes to the point of deciding they want to have a root canal tooth pulled. What do we do next? Do we leave it there? Uh, and it, you're welcome to share what we've done for, for me in okay. answering this. Yeah, so what are the options? You can leave a hole. I tell my patients, look, um, no one's ever died of a missing tooth. Uh, it, but you have people have died of a sick tooth. So if your tooth is sick, it can kill you. It oh, kill you. The full, and that's that's. This is a known connection. Oh, people die in the hospital of, of untreated abscesses. you I mean. That's we, so scary. We that's that happens all the time. That's not from a root canal or anything. I'm just saying from an abscess tooth, people are dying from right. abscess teeth untreated. Uh, so you can die from a sick tooth. Um, but you can't die from a missing tooth. So at the very, very least, pull the tooth out if it's well, you know, if it's infected, if it's an issue and you made an informed decision, get rid of the tooth if you want, no problem. Get it out, get the, make sure the dentist cleans out the jaw, makes it, cleans out the infection, just have all that discussion up. up hand. say, Dr. Jones, please, please go in there and scrape, scrape, scrape. I don't mind how much you scrape, just scrape and clean, clean, clean that jawbone for me really, really as best you can. And uh, it'll be great, you know. Doctor Jones will be like, "Well, how did you know that?" And it'll just—it'll just be great. It'll be have a real, have a real great conversation, you know, with your dentist about it. Anyway, so you can take the tooth out, leave a space. You can take the tooth out and do a partial denture. We've seen people with partial dentures; they come in and out. They've got little hooks. You can do a bridge, and which, where we where we trim down the two teeth and fix a bridge. And of course, ultimately, you can do a dental implant. Um, dental implant—the one that you have had—a metal-free one is really by far the best replacement option we have today it conserves change you know I'll, I'll talk about some of the concerns that people might have about about, yes, placing, yes. about placing an implant so what does it do when you when you place an, an implant I, I love the metal free all ceramic ones what it does it it stimulates the jawbone because how do you how do you preserve your how do you preserve your any bone you have to exercise stop exercising see what happens to your jawbone well how do you exercise jawbone by eating you gotta you have to put some something between your teeth and and give it some force if you don't have a tooth and a bridge or a, a partial denture they can't stimulate into the jawbone you need an implant to stimulate the jawbone so that when you chew your jawbone receives the exercise and says great i gotta keep the jawbone there because i'm getting exercise fantastic and so so that so, so there's a lot and then you don't have to drill on the other teeth so lots of benefits to implants well, what about the down? What about the risks or the concerns? Right, people have concerns about putting something mm -hmm. in, their, in, you know, in their jawbone. There's no procedure that has zero risks, right? Uh, that's for sure. And there's no no um, no procedure that has zero risks. But a dental implant, as far as its biocompatibility, as far as its you know utility, um, it's a very. I've done thousands of dental implants uh, on patients over the years. You've You've had some as you as you've shared with everybody. Um, I don't have I don't have any health biocompatibility concerns with doing dental implants, especially the metal free all ceramic ones. They don't have they don't leach. They don't contain. They're not porous. Bugs don't get inside of them. They're not like you know teeth where you can't clean out all the infection. They're just a solid block of zirconia. So it's like an ivory like material mm -hmm. and. Um, yeah, and I don't have any. As long as the tooth is removed, 
and the infection's all cleaned out and the jawbone is nice and strong and healthy, then placing an implant into that area is right. Yeah. The bone health and structure is really important. Um, what would be, why would somebody want to get an implant versus just leaving a gap there? Like, are there potential issues that could arise from not having an implant? You'll lose jawbone. So the jawbone in your area will shrink and deteriorate. If you're missing a tooth right now and you're listening to this, just run your index finger along your, you know, on the inside of your, along the gum line where you have teeth, you'll feel that there's, it's nice and thick and built, built out where you don't have a tooth, run your finger along that space, right next, right into that space. And you'll notice that your jawbone caves in. So you, you know, we talk about mineral density, bone density. We're all excited about, oh, we got to maintain our bone density. Well, bone density is just, you haven't lost volume in bone density. You've just, what you have has become less dense. When you lose a tooth, you're losing bone volume. You're losing proper jawbone. Forget about density. So jawbone loss is a big one. Your teeth tip, your teeth tip over. So it ruins, ruins your bite. Your upper teeth drift down into that space. And so a really beautiful bite like yours, you know, you don't, if you don't replace it, all of a sudden, all the teeth start to crowd and you're over 10, 15 years, your teeth just start to mish, mishmash and, and it ruins bites. It's mm. better to replace it if you can. And if you can't, if you can't, don't keep a thick tooth in. Get rid of it still. Because no one ever died from teeth that were like this. Right. Yeah. That's a good way to say it. Um, and, and just really quickly, before we move on to our next topic of, of just the total dentistry picture, yeah. um, what can someone expect if they get their tooth removed? Like I, I could share, I've had my second one done. I had to do either side. And we had to wait four months for the bone to heal, right? Can you just share what someone can expect if they're going to have an implant put in after pulling a tooth? Right. So with the ulceramic implants, a lot of times we're able to place a tooth the same day. It's not always possible, but we try and do it the same day, which is wonderful because it saves our patient four months of wait time because we can put the implant in the same day. Four months later, boom, you're ready. We put a crown on. But usually we have to take the tooth out, wait three or four months, put the post in, let the post become solid, and then put the crown on. So start to finish, you're looking at, let's say, eight months from start to finish. If it's a front tooth, you got a root canal up here. Well, of course, we have to give you something temporary so that you don't walk out there with a hockey, you know, hockey player. <laughs> uh, look, you have to have something temporary to go out there with. So it's a, it's, a, it's a process of anywhere from, let's say, five to eight months from the time you take the tooth out to the time you have an implant replacement. And is there, I'm just answering a question on Instagram, is uh, how long is too long to go without putting in an implant? It'll be dependent on the person, but if you have been missing the tooth for, let's say, 18 months or more, 18 months or more, almost certainly you're going to need to add bone. You okay. will almost certainly not have enough bone. Doesn't mean you can't have an implant. It means now you need an, an additional procedure, bone regeneration. Yeah, I talk about that on the podcast. Bone regeneration so that we can build what's been lost and then place the implant. Yeah, and you did some interesting things with me. Like you, you took blood plasma, right, um, and then it also inserted calcium chips to help strengthen the integrity. Right, I thought that was pretty neat, just to work with my own blood, right, to to help it rebuild. Right. Cool. Okay, so we're coming up on an hour. I, I do want to make sure we talk about just how the how your um, perspective has shifted to to really. And not, not your perspective, but how the field of dentistry is perhaps shifting to really understand the role of uh, that total picture. So when, we, when, we, when you say total health dentistry, what does that truly encompass? Yeah, thanks for that question, because really I've, I'm trying to really shy away. I don't like so much the word holistic dentistry. Because Why is that? Yeah, because what does it mean, um, holistic? I mean... You can bring a hundred people into a room and say, who's holistic? hundred people raise their hand and then you go through and you talk to them. And you say, so tell me, tell me a little bit more about your life. And you'll hear. So I try to be so. And, and so for me, it's a label. I don't really so much like it to me. It just makes to me. What I do is common sense dentistry. I swear to God, that's all I can think about when I talk to my patients is look, they come to see me. I'll say, look, 
I really believe what I'm going to recommend to you is common sense dentistry. And um, it doesn't make sense for you to have this, this, and this going on, or, or does it? So we just have that conversation about what, what makes sense and what's, what doesn't make sense for that in, individual. But total health dentistry for me is, is sort of like my, is the banner I guess I'll use, which really just means to me that, yeah, um, we know that the, the mouth health is affected to the body health and things that happen in your body can affect you in here. That's very vague and, and, and whatever. So I've kind of come up with three pillars of, mm -hmm. right, of total health dentistry to help us all daily as we talk about this, kind of narrow in on what it is. So number one, it's airway. Number two, nutrition. And number three, structure. Airway. Not nutrition. flossing. Sorry? Not flossing. <laughs> I feel like growing up, that's all my dentist ever said was don't right. forget to floss. Right. That the conversation that, that you know I'm trying to have with my patients and with your audience and everybody. So that's why I made this podcast, is because the conversations that I was having in my, you know, in my chair, in my in my operatories, I think were things that many, many, many people want to hear and want to be involved, want, want to be, you know, listening in on. And so the uh, the airway nutrition and structure, so everything can fall into into that, into that uh, you know, into those three categories, oral hygiene. Um, but if you want me to talk a little bit about airway, nutrition, and structure, do you want me to touch well, on let's, that? Let's just talk, what do you mean by airway? Because the, I, I keep hearing about that. I keep reading about this. What does that exactly mean? If there's one tsunami that's coming to a shore near you from a health standpoint, it's airway, okay? Everything that we know about how important um, various minerals are, nutrients are, yes, they're all important. But what's the master nutrient, Ange? What's the master nutrient? Oxygen. Oxygen, right? You can have a great dosage of all your you know, vitamins and nutrients and minerals you want. But if you have any deficiency in oxygen, right, you're going to suffer more than you have any other deficiency uh, in other nutrients. And conversely, the more optimal oxygen you have, the, we're, what we're learning now, so what we're learning now about airway is that not... We knew oxygen was always important to live, but we didn't realize just how important it is. And we, most of us in our daily lives, based on, you know, allergies that we've had as kids, based on allergies we still may have, based on the environments we live in, we're not getting proper oxygen. When we were, from the time we were born, okay, this is what I talk about so much on that podcast is how do you ensure that your child gets the best structural creation of an airway? Airways are soft tubes. They're very, very fragile. They need to be protected. They need to be developed. They need to be safeguarded. I'm very, very passionate about this. Airways are soft, precious tubes that can easily be compressed. And so we need to safeguard these airways through, of course, nursing uh, as much as possible in the in the early early stages, giving moms, uh, you know, advice and 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 um, yeah, some advice on how to eat so that they don't have they have less colic, making sure that the baby is properly, the tongue is properly functioning. There are many, many, many aspects that go towards developing a proper airway. Nutrition is very, very important to getting a good airway because, of course, if you have, if you have, um, you know, you're eating foods that are inflaming you, you're going to be congested. You're going to be clogged. You're not going to be able to breathe properly through your nose. And that uh, we go, and it's a huge pillar of nutrition. And then finally, structure. Because if you do airway and nutrition properly, you'll you'll end up with good structure. And the structure is the it's it's the one that no one talks about. It's it's so so important. I'm not saying no, maybe you do, but in general health circles, structure is like a you know, it's like, whoa, what do you mean by that? I mean, how do you even wrap your head around structure? So we talk a lot I talk a lot about structure um, on the podcast, but airway, nutrition, and structure are the three pillars of total health dentistry and it's uh it's a movement in dentistry and something that uh, I hope you'll check out, learn more about. One of the things you said on your on your podcast, and, and you have a new website we'll link up, you talk about how this relates to different uh, age groups, right? As you age, approaching the conversation a little differently. Um, is that an episode that you've recorded on? Absolutely. So the first five episodes are on total health industry, airway infrastructure, then from six to 15, are a walk through the stages of life. I started to think about how do you treat a child before they're born? 
Yeah. Uh, and I, and I, th- I have some thoughts to share about that. So please check out the podcast because that's where it starts. Treating a child before they're actually physically born. So you're and saying birth, you're saying dental health starts even before the child is born. 100%. Does it in some way start even before conception? 100%. Like with mom? 100%. Even, yeah. So I talk about, exactly. So then the episode is, uh, another episode we talk about going into pregnancy with stocked shelves. Oh, I love that. Like a grocery store analogy. You yeah. go into pregnancy, yeah. ideally, okay, we're talking about ideal and we're always, no one, who's ideal? No one. So, but what are we trying to do? We're trying to go into pregnancy with shelves that are stocked rather than going into pregnancy with stel- shelves that are half, you know, they That's so good. Yes. And, and that conversation um, is happening a lot more where women are actually preparing to become pregnant, right? That's a, such a great topic. I'm glad you're exploring that. Um, Jan asked, so sleep apnea would be related to dental health then, right? Correct. Correct. We sleep apnea, obstructive sleep apnea, there's two types of it, but obstructive, if there's a physical obstruction to it, I think I think we're seeing sleep apnea now and more and more, but we're, it's it's uh, it's downriver, right? We we didn't uh, we it's it's all downstream. We're seeing this stuff happening downstream. We want to treat it upstream. Hmm. Sleep apnea is an airway failure upstream, right? That that individual obstructive sleep apnea. That individual, you know, didn't get the care probably that they needed. Um, or advice that they needed upstream. So now they're 50 years old and now they have sleep apnea, for example. Now, sleep apnea, you can have that as a child as well. Okay. Okay, a couple quick questions for you. So what about the role of supplementation? Uh, Specifically, we hear a lot about vitamin D, probiotics. Do you you advocate for that? Yes, absolutely. I take I take vitamin D during the summer. I take a good, you know, sublingual uh, spray of vitamin D on in the summer, in the winter. I'm sorry, uh, did I say summer? I you know. did. I yeah, we knew what you meant. What about K2? Do you do a blend with K2? Yeah, I heard that. Hundred yeah, percent. Okay. K2, K2, D and K2. Um, I'm going to talk about in a few other episodes. Look, this episode, this uh, podcast that I'm starting. I don't mean to go back to it, but the, the content. You want to. You want to sort of. You're asking these questions. All of these great questions. I'm. I'm, I'm, I'm once and for all going to put them out on this podcast so that people can really just tune in whenever it suits them. It's going to be small bite-sized pieces. But on this topic, you know, Weston Price actually discovered, um, he didn't know what K2 was then. He called it um, Activator X. Hmm. Activator X. And it later came, and he found this was vital in um, Aboriginal cultures throughout where he, where he was studying for them to really have strong, healthy bones, strong, healthy arches and teeth. And, um, but that's K2. We need K2 and D. So I'll spend plenty of episodes talking all about these and getting into the detail. And probiotics as well, I assume play a big role in like the, 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 the integrity of the microbiome is important. hundred percent. Gut health is, is pivotal. That's, that's nutrition. So of the, of the end of the nutrition pillar, I spend a lot of time talking about gut health. So I love probiotics, uh, obviously bioavailable probiotics as you, as you are advising very, very uh, smartly that don't just throw your money away, mm-hmm. um, bioavailable probiotic. And of course, I also love live foods that have a ton of probiotics in them. Yes. Sauerkraut. I love sauerkraut, kimchi, um, yeah, any, any pickled foods, wherever you can find, you know, when you get in tune with your body and you see something that's pickled or fermented on the table. If there's a voice inside of you calling you to go grab it, there's some your your biome is telling you you need more probiotics. Go and grab it. Don't be shy. Get in there and grab it. Grab your share of fermented food live. Good tip. I love that. Um, last question, it, especially because of uh, there being so many moms on. Yes. Do you have any good recommendations for starting off kids with a great oral health routine? Like what, you know, there's a lot of things that I've talked about in the past, like tongue scraping and oil pulling, and of course using, um, remineralizing toothpaste, just staying away from some of those more known toxic load situations. Um, we use a lot of essential oils in our home and within this community, like you do in your practice. So I just, I wonder like if you were to say to a mom, here are 
one, two, or three things you could do for your child to give them the best start in developing a ritual for themselves? What would they be? I'm a father of three children, 10, eight, and six. And um, I've grown into my role as a dad. I wasn't always uh, so um, aware, or I wasn't just such a, yeah, such a, an, a in the moment and an aware dad. And that's something I've, I, I share very humbly um, that, that, that's come to me in the last number of years. So the first tip I have, I mean, the first thing I encountered was how do you actually get into the mouth and help your child? I mean, how do you, how do you wrestle this little guy, you know, this little monkey down and, and get the, get this routine going, right? That, that's the first step. That's the first tip. And what I found to be personally most successful is um, you've heard of attachment parenting. Mm -hmm. So we practice attachment parenting. Uh, I'm not saying it's right or wrong, but that's what we do. And I found it to be my number one best oral hygiene tip because <laughs> so, so I'm being very practical and very real with you. If I want to floss and brush my six-year-old, right? And he needs help flossing. If I want any chance of getting in there and flossing my six-year-old child. I have to connect with them first. Yeah. I got to get down on the ground, play a little Lego, do whatever I need to do so that we connect after a long day. And then I, then it's like, then I can get in there and get the flossing done. So my, my first tip for parents is do whatever you're, is right for your family, but try to get that connection first and foremost so that they'll even allow you to do a proper oral hygiene. I or love that. Or something, right? Then after that, honestly, what happens after that is much less important. But in the, in the but it is important. So then and that's in the sequence of things, floss first. If you can, get in there and floss first. Get the big pieces of, get the chicken out, get the broccoli out, whatever, get the big pieces out. Secondly, brush with a tiny little tooth, toothbrush, something that can get in there and, 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 and brush really well. And thirdly, what do you use for tooth paste or tooth? I love essential oils, as you know. Uh, doTERRA has a terrific, terrific lineup. I've been, I've been using them. And uh, so use, but ultimately the thing is your child has to like it, obviously. So it has to be something that's child friendly for taste. And um, we don't, we don't use, yeah, we don't use Colgate. We don't use that stuff. My children find it like far, far, far too sweet, actually. I give them some feedback for Colgate. Well, and a lot of the, the toothpaste marketed towards um, infants and young children actually have like sugars in them. And it, it's almost like they're, they're trying to get them into the routine of using a paste, but it's actually yeah. something that could be harming their teeth. That's what I found when the kids were young. Um, so even with the girls, as soon as we started um, integrating, uh, I, I started using doTERRA about six years ago and they've grown up with that toothpaste now. We love it. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to add that in. I, I was shocked uh, when Chloe, who's now 10, um, first started to grow little teeth, there were really no good options out there. I couldn't find something that didn't have sugars or fake sugars and just, yeah, yucky ingredients. So um, somebody asked also with kids, uh, what about a low phytate diet? Like, are, is there other things within the diet we should be paying attention to when they start to eat foods? Yeah, I mean, well, well phytates will come from, from um, like, uh, phth phthalates or the plastic phytates or the, the, inhibitants on nuts and seeds mm -hmm. that, that, that break up the absorption. So you, I've never heard of a low phytate uh, sort of diet, but what you want to, or, or a style of eating, but what I would, but if you're concerned about phytates, of course, we, and we all should be, we should be soaking our nuts and our seeds before consuming them. Overnight yeah, soaking. So. Mm -hmm. Overnight soaking. Um, it's, it's, it's simple and easy to do. Very cool. This has been so great. Um, I do want to make sure we finish off just letting people know where they can find you um, and also how they can find your podcast. I, I did see quite a few people asking what the name of it is, when it's launching. So why don't you first share uh, about the new practice that's opening in Kitchener, Ontario? Of course. It's called Sante Family Dental. So S-A-N-T-E Family Dental dot C-A. And no matter where you are in the world, go there and click, look for the podcast links and you'll find the podcast also on iTunes and Stitcher and all the other venues. But if you go to my website and register, you'll get the launch details, which will be launching next week. They're all being edited right now. The first 15 episodes, the first five are what is total health dentistry, airway, nutrition, structure, and much detail. And the next 10 episodes are the walk through life from before birth, ages zero to three, four to six, 
uh, 7 to 19, there are very specific things that happen that I want parents and you know folks to be aware of um, from the airway nutrition and structure standpoint that happen at all of these ages. The next one after you know that is young adulthood, then the middle years, and then finally seniors. Um, and that's just the first 15. After that, we're going to go into many, many, many of these topics in much, much greater detail. And I hope that gives a lot of value to people because that's, that's what it's for. Wonderful. And the website's new. It's just going up. Um, so all those resources there, we'll include them in the show notes, you guys. But thank you. You, you have a very gentle nature about you, which I, I think um, is so appreciated, especially in a space that can evoke a lot of fear for people. And this conversation has been so helpful. I love your perspective of, of honoring your, your patience with, with the process and, and being very humble through that, you know, um, and not forcing, I guess, a certain way of thinking on people, but just understanding that it's so important to ask questions. I think the one big takeaway from an episode like this, you guys, is ask questions, get a second, get a third opinion until you come to a place of truly feeling confident to make that decision. Every decision we make for our health will always have an effect. So you, it's always about weighing all factors and, um, and ultimately making a decision that feels aligned. So thank you. Okay. We're going to cut off recording. Now you guys we will get this uploaded um, to the podcast tomorrow and the video will stay on the whole fit brand page. If you want to come back and see it from the beginning. Thanks Angie. Okay. You bet. Hey, thanks for tuning in to today's show. If you liked the content, please consider hopping over to iTunes and leaving a review so that more people can find this show. If you have a question or a topic suggestion for future shows, head over to wholefit.com forward slash pod question. You can also find all past episodes and show notes at wholefit.com forward slash podcast. See you next time.